is how I was feeling in 2010. I had overcome a huge number of obstacles, extricated myself from an incredibly difficult and scary marriage, grabbed my two daughters, who we were living together, and they were thriving. Oldest went off to college, next was on her way to college, and I was running advertising agencies in New York. Uh, in fact, I ran multiple agencies, and I start them, and I started them, I built them, and I was feeling like Wonder Woman. I, I, I can do this thing. And one piece I didn't tell you about getting out of that um, brutal marriage was I was uh, diagnosed with cancer for the first time while I was in the middle of a divorce. And so I was having my hysterectomy at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I was running out to the court to battle in this very difficult situation. And so being at this place was miraculous to me. And it was a few years that passed where we were all thriving, this girlhood in our household, I called it the house of hormones, um, until I got that phone call that you don't want. It wasn't the three-month checkup from the nurse saying you're fine, or the six-month checkup saying you're fine. It was the oncologist who said, Anne, I'm sorry for this bad news, um, but the cells are accelerating, we have to do more research. We have to do more surgery. So I thought, okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm Wonder Woman. I've got grit. I've been surviving on grit for 25 years. So I put on my way higher shoes than these, that time four-inch heels up Madison Avenue, walked into my boss's office and said, bad news, going to have to have some more surgery. I will be taking a couple weeks off, but I'll be back. I'm going to run this company like I always do. This was the middle of the recession. I was running a turnaround and not a startup. Stakes were high, and he said, I'm going to have someone else run the company. And in that instant, I lost my job. I lost my sense of self. I lost my health, and my last kid was leaving the nest. So I went from this to this. Now, what do you do when your entire self-definition has been based on things somewhat outside of your control, and they're gone? Well, I fell into this deep question of, who am I? If I'm not, hi, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the CEO, and if I'm not, hi, I'm, I'm learning Kira's mom, and if I'm not, hey, we're all waiting for the gym to open at 5.30 this morning because, you know, that's what we do every morning before we go to work and do our things. I did not know who I was. And so when you're stripped of this at almost 50 years old, what do you do to start your life again? Well, I spent a whole lot of time in a place that I call the space in between. The space in between is after what was, after everything you knew that got you to that place, the familiar, the routine, the, the places where you're confident, um, and before you've figured out what will be. And I was someone, when you're driven and you're successful and you're determined and you're trying to be Wonder Woman, I was really blinded by the doing. I was blinded by the doing so much so that I hadn't gotten a sense of the feeling, of the time to process and to think and to feel vulnerable because the, the vulnerability was too scary in environments that are threatening. But I didn't have a choice now, right? I had, I had very little else. One great thing I had was the guy I'd been dating cross country who helped me understand what I was processing. And among many things like going and doing the same thing again is probably a really bad idea. It's kind of killing you. Um, he also said, maybe you should rethink this. And uh, I was in New York, he was in California, and he said, let's, let's start a life in California. Now, that sounded pretty good to me, because when I was sick, the thousands of people that I'd worked with, I'd worked for them, they'd worked for me, we worked with each other, those people for the most part, with the exception of my loving family and less than this many friends, were gone. Without power, without authority, I was neutered in the work world. 
And so starting again based on a new set of values that were not dependent on transactional relationships felt like a really meaningful thing for me to do. So I jumped. I dropped Kira off at college at Tulane, kept heading west, landed in San Francisco. I was standing on our roof, looking out at the bay, thinking, how did I end up in this gorgeous place? When all of a sudden I realized I didn't have a friend to have over for a drink. I mean, that sucks. I needed, I needed girlfriends, I needed cocktails, and I needed to think about how do I start to fill that void? So what do you do when you end up in a new place, you've got an amazing boyfriend, now husband, um, but you don't have a support system? Well, what I started doing was looking inward and thinking about what made me happy in the years that I was super happy. And what made me happy were sisters, daughters. I went to Wellesley College. And I realized that during all those times in that super male world of advertising where you're slugging it out and sucking it up and working like crazy, that I had missed the intimacy of female connection and that I was feeling lonely and disconnected as a result of, of not having it. So I decided to try an experiment. I didn't know people, but I knew people who knew people. And I said, could do you guys know anyone that might want to come over to my house and maybe talk? And I, I, was, I was trying, yeah, I was trying not to make it be too, like, loserish, but I was sort of feeling <laughs> kind of loserish. Um, but amazingly, 12 people, strangers, came over and came into my home and we began an experiment. And the experiment was, what happens when you get outside of your bubble, when you pull people into your home, to your private space, who are people that you don't know, who are different than you? We had 20-year-olds, we had 80-year-olds, we had a range of races and sexual orientation and hometowns, and we got together and grounded it in content. I grounded it in content because I'd been a fellow of the Aspen Institute, and I'd had a couple of years of amazing learning where very different people, grounded through shared experiences, were able to develop some bonds that I was trying to replicate in some way. So the first time, uh, a friend of mine named Tamsin Smith, who's a poet, led us in a very loose discussion of how do you make poetry accessible. But it really wasn't about that. It was about the common content providing a platform. And the amazing things that started to happen was, as soon as we had a common platform, all of those feelings that I had been repressing about feeling vulnerable and feeling isolated and feeling like I was alone in this world, I would put something out there and one of the other women in the room would say, me too. This is 2012. This is before Me Too meant the important things Me Too means. But in our world, Me Too began to mean the ability to bond on things that there aren't other safe places to discuss. So 12 women left and said, we should do this again. And each one decided, we'll bring two or three more people together. And 12 became 40, became 80, became an organization that I now call Parlay House. Parlay House is in nine cities around the globe. We, we have over 5,000 women that are participating. And we called it Parlay House because we recognized in some way we were all in a transition whether it was transitioning a life stage, whether it was a career, whether it was um, a relationship, everyone who was open to connecting had stopped looking straight ahead about the doing and started to center in on the feeling. And so parlay meant transitioning one thing to another. It also very conveniently is the verb differently spelled in French to speak. And then when I went to buy the website, I found I'm not a gambler, but I found parlay house is a gambling term, which means the stakes are higher when you're in it together. And that felt like, aha, this was meant to be. And it, it started to blossom. And when it started to blossom, more and more women would gather in my home. And then we moved it to New York with a second uh, group, and then we moved it to Oakland and DC, and it's now in Paris and London, and hopefully in a couple of months it will be in Amman, Jordan. In each place, providing safe spaces for women to have conversations with women that they would never have met in their lives 
um, and to develop, to develop bonds that cascade. Now, this idea of cascading is super core to what I wanted to talk to you about today, because as this was happening and I started tracking it, I would hear stories like, uh, I was walking through the park and I found a purse and then I came here to Parlay House afterwards. I felt so good that I sent the purse to back to the person whose, whose belongings were in there and pretty soon I got a letter back from her and it's, the letter said, um, thank you for, for sending back my purse. When I got it back, I was so grateful that there are good people in this world that when I went to school the next day, they were doing a fundraiser and your money got tripled. So I gave the money in my purse to the fundraiser. That was interesting, a cascade of one person to another person that then got multiplied. What's happening here? And we started to hear these stories of people inspired and included and hired and supported as a, as a result of what we were doing. So, I decided to write a book about it and decided maybe I needed to make sure that there was some science behind this, uh, this feeling that I was getting, these sort of more vague stories, and not being uh, confident in my own ability to conduct scientific research. Uh, I contracted with an amazing social scientist at UC Berkeley, Dr. Serena Chen, and together we did super interesting market research. The market research bucketed random online samples, 350 people ages 18 to 44, and we gave them one of three assignments. We said either, you're a giver. If you have a story of a time you did something out of kindness, out of generosity, out of inclusion, out of seeing someone who you did something for, tell us your story. Tell us the story of the cascade that happened as a result of your giving. The second bucket, we said, you're a receiver. Can you think of a time that somebody did something to you that was sort of a catalyst in your life? Tell us your story. And then, not wanting to fail in our research, we created a third bucket, which was the, oh shoot, what if they don't have a story to tell me bucket, otherwise known as the witness. So the witnesses couldn't think of a time they'd done anything nice for anybody. <laughs> they couldn't think of a time anybody had done anything nice for them. But they could tell us a time that they'd seen something happen between other people. And we started looking into the depth of the witnesses' stories. Now, the, the givers were obviously people who were already seeing others, right? They were, they were kind, they were generous, they noticed somebody might want to be included in an event or might need to be told that there was green on their teeth before they went into a meeting. And they could see that it was a more meaningful outcome than what they bestowed. The receivers took on the behaviors of the behavior of the givers. You might expect that that would happen, uh, that something nice was done for them, they passed it on. This is very familiar, very familiar to you probably as pay it forward. So what was the difference between what is happening as a result of these parlay house gatherings and these connections of women beyond pay it forward? Well, the answer was in the witnesses. Because the witnesses would tell us stories like, I was sitting outside of 7-Eleven, minding my own business. The guy next to me goes into 7-Eleven, gets his stuff, comes out, and he buys an extra sandwich, and he hands it to this homeless guy who walks across the street and shares a sandwich with other people. A couple questions later in the survey, the same person tells us that the next day, they realized their ability to do something like that, and when they were at a store, they walked out with a sandwich for another person. Now, what this said to us was there's a cascade effect that's broad. The, of, in each of our ability, when we have very, very little, these were, these were not powerful people bestowing their greatness upon others. These were not rich people doing costly things that couldn't be replicated. These were very small actions that were about seeing and including and maybe loving somebody in their vulnerability or aware of your own vulnerability that was motivating and meaningful. And we thought, aha, we're going to call this the parlay effect. So that's what the book is about. The book is about our own personal ability, not only to find strength in ourselves and to understand 
what our value systems are in the way that I figured out sort of too late that I was missing the connection in my life and, you know, lost some years before I really could feel as good as I do now with the work that I'm doing because it feels so valuable. But we, we found that this cascade can be replicated by anybody and everybody who's willing to see other human beings. And at a time in our society when we feel incredibly overwhelmed by gaps between all of us, knowing that you can find a stranger, you can invite a stranger into your home, you can share something vulnerable, vulnerable about yourself that not only makes you feel seen and heard, but gives them permission to be vulnerable. It gives them permission to expose something about themselves and give something of themselves to other people. So what I would say to you all is vulnerability, your truth, and your ability to see other people's vulnerability without judging, just in a way that allows you to know how to help them on one small level is gonna start a cascade that is giving us power in a time in society when so many of us feel powerless. Parlay House is the movement for women. There is no reason this needs to be a female movement or a female observation. The stories in our market research came from men and women, and together we have the potential to reveal ourselves, to embrace each other, and to make this world a better place. Thank you very much.